Good morning, everybody. Well, I looked at the list of speakers, and I must say it's a little intimidating to have to follow on as a scientist to come up at, behind people who are used to appearing in front of TV cameras and, and being on the radio. But I must say I'm extremely relieved because one of the speakers I feared to follow was one of the two people I knew were going to be free this week, and that was either Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, and that they're not here, so <laughs> that's where we're starting. I wanted to come today and talk to you about some of the things that are going on right here in Grand Rapids at the Van Andel Institute, one of the powerful brain trusts in the country. And I know if you've ever talked to somebody who lives in New York City and said, have you ever been up in the Empire State Building? The answer is no, because they live there and don't have to do that. You have the Van Andel Institute, a tremendous brain trust here in Grand Rapids, and I wanted to make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on. Now, I'm a little nervous doing this, and I said to my wife, you know, I've got all these people to follow. I'm supposed to give a talk. The guideline said, just think of it as the best talk you've ever given. I thought, oh, great, that's <laughs> ter terrible. So she said, well, you know, just uh, keep your jacket buttoned and uh, keep your hands out of your pockets, and you'll be fine. So. Um, I know there are thousands of books downstairs uh, all around us in Grand Rapids in all of the libraries that you work in. And some of the earlier speakers talked about failures. A lot of what we do fails. And I'm thinking of all these books that are here. From a medical point of view, I don't have to go back more than 20 years, and almost everything that's in those textbooks is incorrect. Now, it gets a little worse than that, because I also know that all of the science we're writing today that seemed so brilliant at the time is likely wrong. So we have to make progress in incremental steps. The other thing I thought about, if I'm going to be talking to uh, people who work in the library with books and words all the time, I made sure that all of my slides were only pictures and have no words on them. Now, I'm supposed to be able to see the slides in the mirror behind me. That was the trick, but right now I'm looking into a searchlight. So <laughs> we will have to go from there. What I wanted to focus on today, and I know the lights are fading some of this out, one of the breakthroughs in cancer, but not only cancer, all of medicine is going to be personalized medicine. Right now, when we treat uh, someone with a drug, we, we treat them with a drug that works maybe 30% of the time or 40% of the time. So the drug you gave me for my blood pressure isn't working, okay, we'll switch you to another drug. It's not that the drug isn't working. For those 30% of people for whom it works, it's going to work all the time. The other 70%, it's never going to work. Most likely, they don't have the target that the drug is, is shooting at, and it's never going to work. We've never had the tools to look at that, and I'm here to say that we now do have those tools to be able to decide for you what drugs may be best for you. So what you're looking at now is the time of day in the hospital where most heart attacks occur, because if you're a patient in a bed and you have this whole team walk in the room, you think, what is wrong? <laughs> uh, and actually, everything is right. This whole team is here to help you. But what we're trying to decide is, what do we as scientists and clinicians do for you that is only for you? And so what we would like to do is come up with a therapy that's designed for you. So picture a capsule of medication that says, your name here. This is John Smith's medicine. Uh, and I want to spend the next few minutes telling you how we go about doing that. I need to take you back to your basic biology. And all of you remember, this was the state of the art when I went to school at last century. <laughs> this is the human cell, and there is only the outside. And in the middle is the nucleus, and that's where the DNA is. And DNA, as you remember, is the code of life. And that's all you needed to know. And then recently, I went back to uh, Wikipedia to find out what advances have been made. And it turns out that the cell is a little more complicated than I had remembered. But what I want you to think of is that you are looking simply at a physical structure here. So this looks like a city, and it's got tremendous numbers of organelles in this cell. And so we realize that structurally, 
This is much more difficult than we ever thought it would be. This is every cell in your body that is going to look like this. Not only that, but we found out that the cells are able to carry on conversations. These cells talk not only within themselves, from the cell membrane to the nucleus, because that's where it's happening, but they can also talk to cells adjacent to them and cells that are distant to them. So if this looks complicated, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. It is very complicated, and we are just learning now to listen to cells and figure out what they're saying and how to intervene in this, in this whole process. And I'm also here to say that we're making great strides at doing that. Believe it or not, we now have medications that intervene in some of these cellular processes. So you may see in the lower uh, right-hand corner there, there, there are signals that tell the cell that you need to die. Something went wrong in the cell. You're not working properly anymore. You need to die as a cell, and the mechanism is put into place, and the cell dies. Other signals say you need to grow and multiply. That happens. Other signals say, okay, that's enough. Stop. Don't grow and multiply anymore. And in terms of cancer research, I'm here to say that all of those systems are in play. They just aren't working correctly anymore. So the signal that says grow continues to say grow and grow and grow. And the signal that's supposed to say stop isn't working. All of this is controlled by the master switch, DNA. And what I want you to be able to do is, after this lecture, the next time you have people in the room and they ask you, could you lead them to the textbooks on uh, anything about the, the nucleus or genetic uh, profiling, you can put your arm around their shoulder and say, come on, I know all about that. Do you, do you want the recombinant or splicing or what, shall we, what do you want to see? But really, if you think of DNA as a series of uh, recipes, so what I've got here, it says a gene, but it might be a recipe for brownies. So when you read the DNA and you come to brownies, and it says this is how you make them, that's the information. Now, if the information is written incorrectly, and it says cayenne pepper, it probably aren't gonna be the best brownies you ever tasted, but that's what the recipe says, and that's what's going to be made. Or if you get a recipe that says brownies, 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 you're gonna get a lot of brownies. And that's one of the bases for cancer. Cancer is nothing but cells doing what they've always known how to do. So for instance, when you're born and you're two or three cells, you want them to grow and multiply. You don't want them to become blood or bone or brain yet, you want them to grow and multiply. All of a sudden, you want a liver, but you don't want a liver this big, you want a liver this big. So those cells have to become liver, they have to grow to a certain size, and they have to stop and then they do not become bone or brain, they become only liver. Cancer cells are able to revert to that process and say, I'm going back to the beginning and I'm going to start growing and I don't really care if I function well or not. Uh, and we are learning how to intervene in that process. Well, if you damage that DNA, if you damage the recipe, um, you get malignancies, one thing, many other medical problems, but malignancies, cancer, are one of the outcomes for that. And one of the classic ways we have always used to damage our DNA is uh, cigarette smoke. Um, because of the campaign against cigarette smoking, we have uh, largely uh, begun to overcome the damage from cigarettes, but we've uh, replaced it now with, a, with another nemesis. Um, it turns out that the refrigerator is our new medical problem, not only for diabetes and arthritis and heart disease, but it's also found to be a major driver for the uh, metastatic, for the malignant process. Well, let me spend just a couple of minutes talking about personalized medicine and how we do this. There are a couple of ways that we can do this, and I am only going to focus on one of them but there are small molecules that we can work with. What is that? Those are the drugs that people normally get for their cancers. There are antibodies. We know how to make them in laboratories now, even though our bodies make them, and they are part of our immune system that protect us from infection. Why couldn't we use them to protect us from cancer? Turns out we can, and I will show you that. 
And then we have vaccines. We've used them for years and years now to protect us against infectious diseases. Can we stimulate the immune system to fight cancer? The answer to that also turns out to be yes, but I'm going to focus on just one of these. And a concept that you need to understand is something called targeted therapy. So we talked about this before with, with our drugs. The, the drug for high blood pressure that only works in 30% of patients, it may be because you don't have the target for that drug. So if we are going to treat you for your cancer, we need to find out what target you have first. If I have a bow and arrow and the target is over there and I pull back and I'm aiming this way, you would say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just going to try this and see how it works. That's, that's the way medical practice has been for, we're just going to try this and see what happens. We didn't know how to find the target, and now we do. And it turns out that it wasn't as hard as we thought. That the needle in the haystack, because of the tools we have now, is much easier to find. And that's called the human genome progress process, and we can now sequence, I can't sequence, but we can sequence everybody's gene here. It used to, when it was first done, it took three years, uh, I'm sorry, 10 years and cost $3 billion to do that of your taxpayer money. We can now do it in a week at a cost of $10,000, and by next year, we'll be able to do it in four hours at a cost of $1,000. The problem is that you get three billion pieces of information, and the question is, what do you do with that? I saw a cartoon I liked that showed the pile of DNA sitting on the table, and one of the scientists says, I think I found a corner piece that looked like a puzzle. So how do we find out if you have a target and what makes a good target? Uh, what makes a good target is something that occurs only on the cancer cell, or if we're talking about diabetes or high blood pressure, whatever it is. We want a target that occurs in the disease process and not in normal cells. Uh, there are very few of those. Antibodies are one way that the body has of exquisitely finding a particular uh, part of the body. Uh, that cell that I showed you before, we have antibodies that will find one little tiny molecule on the surface of that cell. We use that now to treat patients with lymphoma. And in, when, in the picture that you're seeing here, those two green pillars that you see with a, an antibody, which is drawn as the letter Y in between them, sort of holding them apart so they can't come together, unless those two green things come together, nothing happens. Now, if you have a cancer cell where those are coming together constantly and the breast cancer is growing and growing and growing, you give an antibody like Herceptin, it stops that process and the growth slows down. Unfortunately, these cells have learned to get around that process, but we have made progress and have known how to do this now. Um, this slide shows those same antibodies, those same upside down Ys, and now we are hooking things to them, like pieces of radiation or chemotherapy drugs. They're called antibody drug conjugates. And Friday, I got my new New England Journal, and the lead story in there is the promise of antibody drug conjugates. To summarize what I'm saying is each of us are unique, and unless medical practice changes to be able to take advantage of our uniqueness and treat us as individuals, we're not going to make any progress. I'm happy to tell you that we are now able to do that, and shortly we are going to be able to design drugs and treatments for you, and it's not as far away as you think. So thank you very much.